Hello! In this video, we're going to look at Stuxnet and some of the technical details from the world's first cyber weapon. So as you might know, Stuxnet was a piece of software, a malware, that was targeted at uranium enrichment facilities in Iran. The United States and Israel, of course, have no involvement that they would admit. But this was a sophisticated piece of software that would literally break this machinery that was running inside this industrial control facility. The point of the video that we're watching now is not so much to tell you about the politics or even the consequences, but we're going to look at what a computer scientist and an information technology person might find interesting, the technical details of how they did it. So the story revolves around industrial control systems. These are the computers that run machinery, and that's why it makes this virus a potentially dangerous cyber weapon, because it is no longer attacking just digital assets. This was actually a physical attack on machinery. And so it set a precedent for other attacks that are likely to come against our power plants, our bridges, airplanes, transportation, medical devices, physical things that can go wrong because they are controlled by a computer. So in the case of Stuxnet, the target was this software here that is designed to control motors. So you can see from this page, this is a page from Siemens, the software manufacturer and the hardware manufacturer. So this is almost like firmware. And the uh, target here was to trick the machines so that they would spin out of control. So uranium centrifuges are spinning uranium ore and enriching it through a, like a, a gravitational kind of a pull. And so the, uh, the machines have to be extremely precise. They run at a specific speed, and the hack was to fool the machine so that it thought it was running at a normal speed, by, but the actual malware had taken over the control of the motor itself and had spun the motor up to high revolutions and down, through a range where they would get harmonics that would actually destroy the centrifuge. And so this is the software that the malware was attacking. Related to this is a specific brand of notebook. You can see that Siemens creates this hardened laptop. Now, um, I have experience working in a factory where the machines were programmed using these extra hardened laptops. They were very expensive, they were very rugged, made out of steel. We could drive a fork truck over one of these laptops and it wouldn't break. And so they were good for temperature extremes and for abuse. And so this was also a specific target for this malware. Now Stuxnet would classify itself as a worm. So we would think of a virus as just any kind of malware, but a worm is a specific type that is able to copy itself automatically from one computer to another, usually across a network. And so most of the time when we say virus, we really mean worm. Now the catch of the systems that we're talking about here is that they were working in an isolated environment. That's called an air gap. When you take a network such as the nuclear facility and treat it like a bubble that is isolated from the internet, isolated from other networks, because we want to avoid these things like malware attacks. So hopefully your municipal power plant is running an air gap. We don't want any hackers coming in. So how did the United States, well, we wouldn't cl claim that they did it, but how would the United States do it if they were behind the attack of an air gap? So they probably didn't have the advantage of using a network. They would have relied on the technicians with their heavy-duty laptops and USB sticks that they would use to update different softwares on different equipment inside the network. And so they were able to jump the air gap through the technicians. So Stuxnet really is an autonomous weapon. You might call it fire and forget. So when it was launched, it was sent off on its own with its full set of instructions to be able to find its way around, look for spe specific types of operating systems or controllers that it was connected to, either copy itself, stay silent, or produce its attack. And so it was completely programmed before it launched. There was no communicating back to the owner to tell it how it was doing. So Stuxnet relied heavily on zero-day exploits. Now a zero-day exploit is an exploit that is 
developed from a vulnerability. So there is something wrong with a piece of code or a firmware, and then the developer would take a look at the uh, possible open door that a vulnerability would leave, and then create its, his own way of changing the program or operating system to run in his own way. So uh, zero day means that no one knows that this exploit exists yet. That's day zero. And so if you know that there is an exploit and nobody else in the world knows about it, you have the advantage of being secret. And there's no detection against it. The virus scanners won't know about it. There's no patch. And so you have an opportunity that is a very limited amount of time before it is discovered if it's going to be effective. Part of the story of this attack of Stuxnet is with Windows CC. Now, you've probably never had Windows CC on your computer. You have Windows 10, maybe 8, maybe 7, maybe you have a Mac. Windows CC, as you can see, is specifically targeted at machinery. And so once again, we have the Siemens logo at the top right corner of this example, and it is an operating system that is only for a specific purpose. So it was very strange when malware analysts discovered that Stuxnet was looking for Siemens controllers and Windows CC, they knew that something was up with industrial machinery. Part of the process of running a machine in a factory is working with PLCs, which are programmable logic controllers. So they're everywhere. And so you think of robotics and uh, industrial machines using PLCs everywhere. And so you can imagine that this is a typical scene from a factory. There's a man here with his computer attached with maybe a serial cable. He is configuring the robot. He is configuring the assembly line. And so this would be the weak point where Stuxnet was snuck into this person's computer and then as he attaches to the machine itself, the virus would pass along to the Siemens controller. So let's look at some of the exploits that were discovered and utilized in Stuxnet. So vulnerabilities eventually reach this point where Microsoft releases a security bulletin, they give it a number, and they tell the user that they need to update Windows so that it doesn't occur. So look at the bottom line here. It tells us what was going wrong with this uh, exploit. And now there are not just one here but Stuxnet used three of these zero-day exploits that were later patched by Microsoft. So you can see that it says, uh, this security update resolves a publicly disclosed vulnerability in Windows Shell. This vulnerability could allow remote code execution. Now that's a key phrase here, so that the virus Stuxnet was able to execute on another computer. The attacker who successfully exploited this vulnerability could gain the same user rights as the local user. So if you were logged in as an admin, the Stuxnet would have those same user rights. So, but that's not the only exploit that was taken advantage of. Here's another one. They attacked printers, a remote ability to connect to another printer, a print spooler service. So it says this date update resolves a publicly disclosed vulnerability in the print spooler service. So print spooling is when you would send a print job to a computer, it hangs on to it, processes it, prints it, and then releases the control. So the vulnerability could allow remote code execution if the attacker sends a specially crafted print request. That means they probably sent some invalid data instead of a regular document. And so, as you know, if you get invalid data, sometimes your computer can crash. It sometimes gives you an error, and that would be the vulnerability. So the vulnerability was changed into an exploit when they were able to take that malformed print document and change it into a command that would allow them to remote execute software on the host. Finally, if you have access to run code on a remote host, you want to make yourself into an administrator on that host. And so this third vulnerability was also exposed. And so you can see the dates on these things were from October of 2010. I think the other one was September. Maybe the other one was August. But this one here says probably the most important of the three is that if you have this vulnerability, you can elevate your privileges. So if you are a regular user, you can change yourself into the root user or to the admin account. And so this 
it says would be the final step in making Stuxnet the control of a system. So they could probably install software, copy themselves to other computers. It was a complete open door. And so the amazing part about this piece of software is that it used these three different zero-day exploits to have its work done. So analysts would say that that is very unusual if you're able to have one of these exploits, but to com combine them with three, these people had either a lot of money or a lot of expertise or both. Now the next part here, we're going to take a look at how an analyst would take apart Stuxnet and find out what it was doing. So the first step of taking apart a piece of software is to reverse engineer it. So you don't always have the advantage of source code when you're looking at a program. So you might not even know what it does. You'd have to watch it. You'd have to look at the statistics. You'd have to look at a static analysis to know where the entry point of the software is. And so what we're looking here is an example of how we would go through the assembly code. Really, we don't have the source code to look at. So we would look at the assembly code, see where the code jumps and forks, where there's comparisons, where it's storing values. And so this is a one way to start when you're trying to figure out what a piece of malware is designed to do. Now the people that get credit for taking a look at this uh, piece of software and analyzing it are Symantec. And so you can see that this is an official document from Symantec called the W32 Stuxnet dossier. Now this isn't really things that people usually go out and read on the internet. So if you've reached this far in the video, congratulations, you can call yourself a truly technical nerd because this is the details of how Stuxnet was built. So if you haven't looked at one of these reports, we're going to learn a little bit about how they analyze malware and what kind of things that this specific program did. So you can see from the table of contents that this is 68 pages long. Obviously I'm not going to show you all 68 pages, but I encourage you to go look at this if you're into finding out how this career would work. There are people whose job it is to do forensic analysis on digital properties like Stuxnet. So it says here that this gained a lot of attention. It's considered the world's first cyber weapon, and it was a, a target like none others that had ever been created before. So in the summary page, we can find out a great deal of how it worked, and maybe that's as far as we'll go. Stuxnet, it says, uses three different vulnerabilities, and you can see them printed here in the orange language. It self-replicates uh, through removable drives uh, using some auto-execution. So there's, a, uh, there's the uh, link that shows us that uh, we have a vulnerability. Uh, then it goes through a network, a LAN, a local area network, through the Windows print spooler. And we looked at the vulnerability announcement from Microsoft earlier uh, that's on the second line. And then you can do remote, co uh, remote code execution here. And then the rest of the uh, description here is very interesting of how they programmed an autonomous machine, you call it, a digital robot, that would take care of its own administration. So it says here, it copies and ex executes itself on remote computers through network shares. Uh, it runs on a Windows CC database server. So not every computer in the world is going to have Windows CC in a database. Uh, it says it works through something called Step 7 projects. So Step 7 projects are the Siemens uh, control and configuration software. It updates itself through a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism within a LAN. And so they had different versions of the software that they would send out. And if one version bumps into another version in the wild, the newer version would overwrite the older one, and it would get an upgrade automatically. Now, I mentioned earlier that there were three patches. It says here there are actually four. It says this exploits a total of four unpatched Microsoft vulnerabilities, two which are previously mentioned, and of the other two are escalation of privileges. And so these, these here were like a collection of very valuable pieces of information, very expensive to get a hold of. Malware in this class would need things such as a rootkit. A rootkit is able to hide itself. And so when you look for a directory scan, a rootkit will uh, intercept that command and say, oh, you want to see all the files on this hard drive? I will show you all the files except for me. And it hides itself through that. Also, when you look for running programs, you would say, show me the uh, amount of memory that each program is using. And it would also hide itself from 
the uh, task manager. And so this was a rootkit that would be able to be invisible to anyone that was looking at the computer. So let's skip down a few pages and let's come to an interesting graph that shows us where the infections occurred, what countries were affected. And so the first country, obviously the IR, was the main target. What is IR? Well, it's Iran. And so that is where the hosts were found in the wild. Now, all the rest of these countries here would just be kind of secondary, kind of uh, casualties in the war, where they spread to places they didn't need to go and probably never affected any machine at all since they were so focused on these specific Siemens controllers. There were different versions of Stuxnet that were sent out there, and they gave them dates based on when they were first discovered. And so you can see that there was this slight small version in 2009. The red piece of pie was obviously bigger. And I believe the, uh, the last one, April 14th, was the one that kind of opened the door. Everyone discovered it because it was uh, more aggressive in copying itself. And so the versions of Stuxnet changed as the attack progressed. Let's scroll down a little bit further until we come to something called Table 3 DLL Exports. Now, this is the result of reverse engineering. So you can see that there's 32 lines here, and this is pretty much pseudocode or a flowchart for a program. And so the analysis at uh, Symantec brought them to this conclusion of how this thing is going to work. First of all, it connects uh, in removable drives. Uh, then it starts in a few uh, file copies, and you can see that it has a verification uh, it calls export 6. So there's like this routine to tell us how the program worked. And so through detailed observations of how the code was jumping around and looking at assembly language, they were able to figure out what the main idea of the flowchart was. Further down in the report, we can see a graphical page of how the uh, flowchart works. So let's go through some of these things that, as a programmer, you might find interesting. First of all, there's a configuration check to see if this program is installed correctly. So it would check itself. It would see, if am I a 64-bit or a 32-bit environment? If it were a 32-bit, then we can keep on going. The next line down says, hey, let's check to see if we're an administrator. If we are, then let's go ahead and continue by injecting ourselves into a running process. But if we're not an administrator, that's no problem. We're going to go to the next branch. Over here it says we're going to check to see what operating system we're running on. So if we are on the older systems, which is Windows XP or 2000, then we're going to run an exploit called the win32k.sys. And EOP stands for Elevation of Privileges. And then once we've done our program that will elevate our privileges, we'll restart the program. Over on the Windows Vista and 7, we have the same thing. We have a task scheduler, a different exploit, and this program will also elevate our privileges. And so then we'll restart. And so this is the flowchart to get the program launched. So the rest of the 68 pages in this document go through the details of how each of these steps work. And so I'm not going to obviously go through 68 pages. However, this gives you an idea into a couple of things. One is that this was a sophisticated piece of software. And two, you have to hand it to these guys at Symantec, whose job it is to look through assembly code, figure out what the program does, find the vulnerabilities, document the whole thing, and then publish it. So when you pay your 20 or $30 for your program to do all this antivirus work, you're paying for some, some pretty sophisticated computer science analysis. And so this is a great look into how the program works and into the job of what an analyst will do. So maybe it'll open your eyes to a career of making yourself into a cybersecurity expert. If you enjoy this kind of thing, you truly are a nerd. Go ahead and look around my channel and you'll see that there's software development, cybersecurity, different things with uh, database security, all kinds of fun things and questionable legality if you use these tools in their incorrect way. So check out the channel. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And thanks for watching.